it's the season finale of this amazing journey it's been three weeks three weeks nine guests one host one yes one conversation and that is a conversation of the heart brought to you by the he arts my collection of short stories and poems uh welcome to the he art live chat Finale! Woo! i see you Lua. i will add you just in a few seconds yes 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 <laughs> south africa i am excited what China, They're pushing it right. Oh wow, my people. Come on, pull through, pull through, pull through. Let me see you come through. Let me see you do your thing. Let me see you do your thing. What? We're going to add my guest. Get ready, get ready. Get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Hello. There we go. <laughs> oh. No, let's get the music to start again so that you can dance a little. <laughs> let's put it here. Can you hear me? Okay. I will let you settle down. Hello, 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 hello. It's that time of the week. It's our Friday on a Thursday. <laughs> what? Uh, you still on? You can you hear me? I'm frozen. Yeah, you were frozen. I can. Okay. All right. It might happen. To, uh, I don't know. I've not. I was normal. I could see you. You. Maybe it's network. But let's trust that the gods of technology will be with us today, okay? <laughs> Let me greet the people quickly. Neranza kumishoweta yungwe nu vitora mi nai siposte tu wakaslangu hailing all the way from Atembisa 1632 and you are watching the He Art Live Chat Grand Finale. Guys, it's been three weeks, nine conversations, nine amazing guests and today we're wrapping it all up. All these conversations are inspired by my book which is a fiction Collection, a collection of poetry and short stories, fictional, but all my guests were sharing about their own lived experiences and we were using the themes in the book to celebrate these conversations. So tonight, I thought, why not close in a way that is going to give us healing? It's going to give us perspective. It's going to give us an opportunity to look in ourselves and to just be truthful for a second. So allow me, let's make a huge noise and welcome Rodele! <laughs> how are you doing? I'm okay, how are you? I am phenomenal. I am glad that you are here. I am grateful that you said yes, and I look forward to this conversation. Awesome, awesome. It's great to be here. All right, for people that don't know you, quickly tell us who are you, what you do, and what brought you here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am Lanele Kasu, I'm a clinical psychologist. And what brought me here, I guess, is just to give a perspective from a psychological point to your characters in the book. 
Um, yeah, so I guess that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before we even get further, because I want to ask you how you got into this field. But before we go there, if you were a fruit at this very moment, at this very second, what fruit would you be and why? Oh my God. <laughs> I have no idea. I think I'd be a pineapple because I'm just craving for pineapple right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, but so if we were to take this pineapple and try to put it into your feelings, to describe your feelings, to describe your headspace, to describe this moment for you, how would that pineapple fit? What would that be look like? I, I think I'll, I'm probably going to be some sucking look and making up a lot of stuff. But, <laughs> I, but I think I'm just a bit of, um, I don't know, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of tank, some citrusy parts of it. Um, so I guess it's just a lot of stuff happening. And I think that's just reflecting of the kind of space that we're in as a country, as people in this lockdown with Corona and all of that. So I think there's a lot happening and maybe there's some thorns on the outside, but there's definitely something to look forward to on the inside. That's beautiful. You still have that sweetness inside, uh, outside of all of this chaos. And uh, it's very interesting that you still, you start there because I think um, the country, the world, is going through a tough time with this coronavirus. And how busy have you been consulting with people? What do you think is the mood at the moment of people? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, it's been quite different because I closed for a while. Um, <laughs> I closed the practice for a while and then only just reopened because we were not very uncertain. We had to think about you know, the safety of the psychologist, but also the safety of the clients. And we didn't really know much about corona to make certain decisions about it. But um, now that we've opened, so we're doing online sessions. Um, so that was going on. But I think people just wanted a much more in-person kind oh. of Because that's how therapy has always um, been framed. People resonate towards that. Um, so oh. But now that you've opened, you've gotten a lot of calls, a lot of people want to come. And I think the state of your mind from the DMs, from the emails, um, and all of that is people are really anxious. I think mm. people are struggling to understand what this is and where they sit and whether they're going to survive. I think as people, we're generally survivalists. And when we don't know if we're going to make it, it creates a lot of um, anxiety because then we don't have the sense of control. We don't have... Um, power over things, we're just feeling like we are powerless and things are happening around us and we don't have control over that. So I think people have been feeling quite a lot of um, anxiety and just um, depressed for some people. Mm. Only they are quarantined by themselves or, you know, I mm. you know, they don't have family. Some people are actually reflecting on the relationships they have with their families, with the people around them. Because I mean, there's less distractions now. You can't go out. You can't, you know, see other friends. So there's a lot of things that you're not able to distract yourself with that, you know, we were successfully doing that before all of this. Exactly. Corona and all of that. Yeah. So people are forced to look into themselves more now in this season, right? Yeah. Um, I, yeah? Yeah, I'm saying yes. Yeah, so I really hope that through this conversation today, we will be able to heal a lot of people and um, just touch on the seriousness and maybe even the beauty of life and looking deep in self. So how did you choose this career? Uh, how did you come about this career? Um, I think I've always kind of known um, that this is what I wanted to do. Um, mm. So... I think what was it, was I, I think it was in grade eight when I decided I wanted to be a a counselor. But the thing is, I didn't really know much about you know counseling and all of that. I was just a little girl from Mississippi who you know didn't get exposure to all of these things. And I think a cousin of mine uh, mentioned psychology to me, um, and then I said, "Oh, that sounds like you know a better version of counseling." <laughs> So I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> kind of explored 
you know, doing that and being a psychologist. Um, and then I went, I guess I studied in Advit. That's when I did my postgrad. And from that point, what did I do? I did industrial psychology actually at first. And I started working in industrial psychology. But I just didn't, you know, like it much. Um, it, it didn't feel like that's what I wanted to do. So, and then after that, I decided, okay, let me, um, let me just do clinical psychology. And then I did that, and, and that's where I am right now. You find that more fulfilling for t- to you? I do, because I think I, part of the reason why I wanted to do psychology is to be part of people's healing process. And mm. now I am part of the healing process more than when I was, you know, working with organizations. And as much as there's a lot of, you know, like employee wellness and all of that, it just didn't resonate with me on a mm. one one kind of basis. So I think that's what I appreciated the most and that's what I love the most, you know. Mm of someone's in a healing process and you can see you know the progress you can kind of like fix it from you know childhood from their experiences so i think just the individual process um resonates better with me i do i mean in my practice um i do work with companies and all of that but um with employee wellness but i think the individual work appeals to me way more but then as a practice we do a lot of other stuff so then other psychologists will do that as according to their interests as well all right no we're definitely gonna have another session maybe in a month's time but this time around we'll be focusing on you as the person and your story and your journey tonight we just want to borrow from your 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 experience and just try to use these scenarios and these characters to reach out to the world and to say something to everybody else out there, trying to heal people. The theme for tonight is healing. And um, so I'm going to start with a piece titled uh, Not Yet Uhuru. It's a poem. I'm going to read it. And then we're going to speak back to um, healing, especially from, we'll start with South Africa. As South Africans, you know, we are dealing with COVID-19. We're dealing with, um, the fear of unemployment, the prospects of retrenchments and unemployment and all of those um, factors. But those are things that are only surfacing today. South Africans in general are still dealing with the issue of um, apartheid and the debate whether or not are we living in post-apartheid or not? You know, are we living in post? Uh, could we say, are we free? Are we living in uh, freedom, in, in a state of being free or is it post-apartheid but not yet attained freedom? So that conflict is what I want us to discuss quickly. Uh, so this character writes this letter. And this character is writing this letter in a poetic form, but to his people. So he's addressing his people. Okay. Not yet Uhuru. It's found in page 29. It says, freedom. 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 Many have asked us, are you free or are you just dumb? We've laughed just to ignore their questions, pretended to have amnesia. Even when those who caused us most pain continue to treat us as unwelcome guests in our own land. We have sound the call to come together, but no one came. We've sat with hope until there were holes on our chairs. We've stood patiently until our shoes could no longer carry the weight of our wounded souls. We cried, like water gashing out of a broken pipe, until we realized that no one was listening. No one cared. Our peace chant slowly turned into struggle songs, and the tales of our fathers returning home as heroes have long reached their sell-by date. Black child, we are on our own. But still, we waited. Shh. Dear Freedom, when we feared what the rest of the world would think of us, tell them we didn't wait because we forgave them. No, remember, they have never asked for forgiveness. Please tell them the truth. Tell them we waited because we did not know we were waiting on ourselves. I feel that a lot of South Africans, whether uh, 
saying it out loud or whispering it in little dinner tables, they are still struggling with that conversation of, we are living in post-apartheid South Africa, but I'm still living in the shack. I'm still, um, they're asking me to social distance in this season, but how do we social distance when we are seven in a two-room shack? And we don't have a yard because when I leave the door, I walk into my neighbor's room, into my neighbor's house. So how do I social distance in the space? So how, what conversation would you have with a client who would come to you feeling all sorts of the, all these feelings at once? Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, that's a, it's a lot, hey? I think it's a lot. Uh, it is a lot because I think a person consists more than of just themselves. Like, you know, like from the poem, it's, your, it's you as a person, it's your family, it's the relationships you have, but it's also your community and the country at large that you've grown up in. And it's very hard to separate those experiences just because they're not immediate experiences or, or that, you know, we were born in the 90s and therefore we just... Exactly. As, as it is. But I think the idea of freedom in, in an individual sense or if a person came for healing in that particular sense is that you have to understand what it is that you can change now and what it is that you can't change. Because I think so many times we get so trapped in the idea of we wanting to be totally free that even the low freedom that we have, we're not able to utilize it to the best of our ability. And it's not to say that, you know, we mustn't keep on fighting for you know, better freedom or better resources or better things. It's just also saying, have the gratitude with the freedom that you have, and that's going to free you even further to start seeing and experiencing all the freedom that's around you. So the process of healing for that particular person is not only just understanding what the problem is or where they're feeling trapped or what they're not able to do because of this background or this cultural background that we have, you know, as black people, but it's also just an understanding of what is it for them that they want to heal from? What is it for them that they're feeling that they are constrained by because of, you know, apartheid and, and post apartheid time? So what is it that they feel like they're not able to receive? And having to kind of do, because it's a grieving process, really, what you have to yeah. feel like what you've lost. You know, you've lost something, whether it's you immediately because you had a relationship with that thing or because you've never had it. So it's like mm. you lost a father, and but you've never met them. You know, having lost, you know, a, a parent or a mother, but you've never actually had them in your life. So you don't know what it feels like to have them, but you know that there's something that's missing. You know mm. that, that's there and you can't experience fullness because you know there's that, there's that particular thing that's missing. So the journey really just becomes a process of what's missing for me, what's the gap for me, um, what is it that I personally want to heal from, from this, because it's something that you're going to keep fighting for a long time. And exactly. Think, you know, even mentioning a person having to come to therapy struggling with this is a difficult thing, because as black people, we believe that we need to do the more tangible needs first before we start looking at our mental health needs. We don't mm. think that's worthy of being explored. How can I go to a therapist, whether it's a free therapist or a paid therapist, when I feel have, you know, when I feel like I live in a shack, when I feel like, you know, I don't have the space that I want, when I don't have the job that I want. But I think part of doing that mental experience or that healing is what helps you to get out of the shack. It is mm. what you get out of that poverty because then you free your mind and the healthy mind becomes the thing that you need to create and new realities. It's the, you know, to see other realities. Yeah. Like I, I grew up in Lusigisi and we didn't really have much to aspire to, or um, you didn't see a lot of, I don't know, CA psychologists or things like that. People mm. to be in other spaces so that they can achieve their goals. So when you're in that particular space, you have to get out. You have mm. to kind of allow yourself to see other places. Whether you decide to come back and bring those resources back is up to you. But you're not going to dream bigger than your current situation if you've never seen anything more than what your situation is like. Wow. You know, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm still stuck at is the idea of grieving for that which you never had. Because I think a lot of people grieve 
for that, but they don't know how to articulate that because it's like, how, if I tell people that I'm grieving the fact that I did not have that experience, they will say, but how can you miss something that you've never tasted? You know, yeah. so people judge themselves and therefore carry the burden and this pain of this missed opportunity. And I think whenever we're speaking about, especially in the context of this poem, that's what sometimes even white South Africa seems to forget when they're dealing with a, a black child who's in the same classroom. Because they're like, but you having the opportunity to be here is freedom to you. But you are thinking, yes, I am here, but my family can barely afford to even pay for me to be here. And that's what I'm mourning. I'm mourning the fact that to come here, I have to take seven, I have to take a taxi and then a train and then walk another five kilometers to just get here. Whereas you can walk down the road or even ride a bicycle to school. So that idea of how, what would we say to somebody who's saying, I'm scared to even articulate the fact that I'm grieving something I've not experienced? I mean, I think the, the, the first thing would have to be to acknowledge it. You know, if you mm. can't acknowledge that that's the space that you're in, you're not going to be able to grieve past that. Because it's, it's the same thing like any other grief, whether it's a relationship breakup or a loss of someone or a death. You have to get to a space where you accept and you acknowledge that this is what has happened. And if you're a person who hasn't acknowledged that, who hasn't said, you know what, I am grieving this, and, and allow yourself to get angry, because I think most of us get stuck in the, I want to be too, I want to be nice, and I don't want to, I guess, perturb spaces and talk about these things, because I'm going to be seen as this angry black person. And then the <laughs> other part of it is getting stuck in the angry black person phase. And I think yeah. you have to allow yourself to transition in the grief stages so that you can be able to, you know, successfully mourn and successfully grieve that particular loss that you didn't have. Because it's an important thing to grieve freedom that you didn't have. You know, mm. to grieve a loss of opportunities that you didn't have is... It's an important thing to acknowledge that as something you don't, you didn't have it. You know, you don't have the privilege of the things that other people may have had, and that's your reality. And if you don't acknowledge that as your black person reality, then you're not going to be able to move past that, and you're not going to make peace of it, or even fight towards getting something better for yourself. Mm. All right, all right, all right. No, I, I, I hear you. And I think that's an important conversation. As you were touching on that and of grieving, I want us to also touch on the fact that, because right now we are living, I, again, it's COVID-19, people are stuck in rooms, in houses, and in situations that otherwise, it would be easy to live with your significant other when you know that you, have a, you can be at the office the whole day and just see them for an hour before you go to bed. And now you are stuck the whole day. There's no office. There's no that. <laughs> you know, and people are starting to have serious conversation. And I think a lot of people have been speaking about relationships that are ending and they've been framing it as if the relationships are ending today. But the relationship might have ended a long time ago. It's only coming to surface today. So I'm going to um, read a piece titled uh, The End and then we're going to discuss uh, some of the, this is a guy writing this to his girl um, as a, a break when they're about to, it's his goodbye to their relationship. Beautiful girl with beautiful eyes. It is I calling, but this time only to say goodbye. Our dance under the rainbow has been cut short by the gray clouds. I tried to find the silver lining, but it seems this time even the sun chose to hide its face from our love story. Hidden between the metaphors of every poem I've ever written are my heart's deepest reflections. So it's true. Some stories end with a full stop and others with a rhetorical question. Ours has ended with an exclamation mark, a statement so bold I am convinced there will not be a sequel to this fairy tale. Our happily ever after is now a distant dream. Angered by the very sight of your being, I have chosen to avoid spaces where you and I could lock eyes. Maybe I blame you for our story never reaching its climax. Or, is it, or has it become easier blaming you than confronting my own shortcomings? I'm a man of my word, damn it. But this time I am without words. 
Like Christ carried the cross, I too shall carry the weight of our unlived dream. Another failed relationship. Another unanswered prayer. Beautiful girl with beautiful eyes. The content of the pages, the content of your pages never matched the expectations created by the cover of your book. I continuously caught myself falling in and out of sleep as I tried navigating my thoughts through the pages of your heart. A boring book you are not, but I no longer can pretend to be enjoying this read with you. It's not you, it's me, or is it really? I shall, call you, I shall not call you my ex, for you have a name. Your memory will not be erased from my history books. My kids will remember. My kids will read of our love. They will know that you once caused my eyes to blink twice, my heart to be silent, so to hear yours beat, a rhythm, a song, an adventure short-lived. To the Juliet of my poetry, a virtuous woman you are, like a fine bottle of wine, You've matured over time. My prayer is that you never give up on your quest for love. For the heart is like a raindrop that has seen the river, but will not rest until it finds the ocean. Though from the same kingdom, you seem, you, though from the same kingdom, we seem to be seated on two opposite thrones. A king and a queen we are, but our love was never meant to be. For if it was meant to be, it would be. So allow me to bid thee farewell. The end. So, um, just before I ask uh, about this uh, experience of this guy and give you a backstory about him, what are your thoughts on that expression? So, I mean, I think it's, there's a lot, there's a lot happening um, in there, and uh, I think, I guess it's the it's the heart of having to express. Um, yourself to someone who may not necessarily understand because you know you were reading the poem from his side but I'm also just like thinking of the girl receiving you know the <laughs> poem <laughs> and having, <laughs> exactly. you know and, and, and just kind of like where his face is and because you can hear he's you know he's being genuine in trying to communicate you know this goodbye and this end but also at the same time there's just a it's, it's a beautiful thing, it's a beautiful gesture to write a poem, but I'm just like, I don't think they'll understand. I don't think they will, yeah, is it, is it me or is it you? Is it, you know, like, you, you, you have beautiful, all of these kind of like compliments that he's giving, but also at the same time, there's just, I guess, the gap of, um, so, so, so what went wrong? And I think maybe yeah. before you started reading the poem, that's the experience of most people, well, of people's breakup during the lockdown and mm. what's going wrong, what went wrong, considering that you were going, you know, things were okay. But I think the reality is if the space, what it does is drift you apart, then things were not okay, you know? Mm. What reflection does, because it seems like in the poem the person is, is, is reflecting. And that's what mm. reflecting causes you to start thinking of things that you'd otherwise not want to think about. You know, it causes mm. you to kind of like get rid of the nice butterfly things in a relationship and it will start showing you the reality of the relationship and whether you're feeling fulfilled or not, um, whether the things that you've been distracting yourself against or not, whether you've been understanding way too much that when you're in the same space for a long time, you're like, but this can't be my life. Mm. Um, and that feels like, because if you think about it, when you are in a relationship, you see each other in the morning, you see each other after work, you probably spend yeah. hours together. Yeah. And right now, that four to six hours has multiplied in one day. You <laughs> exactly. Think, if you've been in a relationship for six months, you probably have spent more time than you would have in, in the past, in the next year. Um, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you're really getting to know the person a year from now, you know, like mm. for the lockdown and we've been in the same particular situation, but I think the reflection of the poem is probably most people's reflections on I see the good and I see what the relationship has done for me, but do I want to continue with it? Is this a exactly. I want to be in? Do I, is this for me? Is this what I want to explore? And I think um, that's usually a tough question to, to answer. And I think for me, one of the questions, it seems as though the guy in this scene 
he's a serial um he's had this i think the battle that is also having if he was your client he would it would be the fact that this is not his first relationship that is ending ugly or it's ending you know he's had a couple so he says in one of the lines another you know relationship ending another unanswered prayer so it seems as though he's had maybe one two three that has ended so to people that find themselves with such in such a situation where they don't want to be perceived as a uh, serial maybe like as people who just stay for the uh, infatuation season you know and then they bounce but at this moment this character is sure that he does need to leave but how does he then reconcile his past experience with this very experience mm. you know it's it's um it, it it's always going back so in if i was i guess to see this person as a client it always has to go back to what what is the pattern of your relationship because mm. it's not just the first one and it's another unanswered prayer but the reality is you can't go into a relationship without understanding what is your pattern of relationship how are mm. you these people that you can see that at the end of the day things just don't happen and things don't um they they don't work out so you have to start understanding what is it that I'm looking for in a person and how am I relating to that person and how they're relating to me and there's a you know there's a video that I watched today by um Charlie but I think it's what it did more than anything is that it reminded me um of you know why we, how we take things so lightly in our relationships and patterns is that we always get into the cycle of dating the same person over and over and over again and we exactly to date that person you know we don't <laughs> want to date that person so I said, I'm not with you <laughs> and I actually don't want you um I want someone else and I think that the important thing about that is we have to start going back to say how do I relate to people what is my mm. Style because relationship is about attachment styles, and to kind of like go back a little bit in terms of attachment styles, that really is about how was I raised, how did I relate to my primary caregiver, and what that mm-hmm. means is that you um you relate to them in the way that they related to you, whether it's pushing the boundaries to say no, my father was an abusive person, I definitely don't want to be that man, or it's having to repeat the same kind of cycle. So you so you must um you know you must go go listen to Kadila's um um clip um I yeah because it it really outlines this because it's about repeating the same pattern or the same cycle about why am I relating to people the way that I am relating and I think it's the same thing for that guy it's why is he finding himself in the particular space and it's not to say that he's at fault. all the time but it's having to say you have to also reflect on your own style you have to reflect on your own relationships and the patterns that you bring to the relationship you know it can be a failed relationship but um maybe it's you but also maybe it's the person or maybe you're just not compatible with each other and that's a reality or something you have to you know to understand maybe it's just you just not people that should be in a relationship all right so um I want to okay let's try let's read this one um it's titled two wrongs don't make a right uh let me see all right we're still good with time all right it's titled two two wrongs don't make a right the back story is a young man as well um it's fun okay yeah maybe let me just read it and not give a back story to this one it says uh a young man by the name of smang was born and bred in the farmlands of kwazulu natal moved to Tembisa township to look after the di- his dying mother his mother left him with his grandmother when he was only 9 months old so she so she could find a job in Gauteng to help feed the family smanga loved farming but since he had now moved to the township he found that he missed being in the farmlands and that the people in the township ate a very unhealthy diet so he decided to farm chickens and vegetables His vegetables grew big and fresh and his chickens multiplied within months. A few months later, when the neighborhood child, when the neighbor's child, Sia, noticed that the chicken and the vegetable farm had now grown into a mini business in the township and almost everyone in the township 
enjoyed the homegrown chicken, eggs, and vegetables, which Smanga sold. He too decided to buy a few chickens to his own, of his own, and he also started farming. A few weeks later, he realized that his business was not doing as well as Smanga's business. He started stealing Smanga's chicken. Every time he would visit Miss Ngosi, Smanga's sick mother, she would tell him to pick a few vegetables from Smanga's mini farm to, every, to enjoy with his family for dinner, for free, without Smanga's consent. When Smanga realized that he had what had happened to his chickens, he went without Smanga's consent. When Smanga realized what had happened to his chickens, he went to the local police station to reopen a case for the he to open a case for theft. Uh, I think I missed the line. Okay, let me go back here. Every time he would visit Miss Nkosi, Smanga's sick mother, she would tell him to pick a few vegetables from Smanga's mini farm to enjoy with his family for dinner for free without Smanga's consent. When Smanga realized what had happened to his chickens, he went to the local police station to open a case for theft, but he had no proof because he had never seen Sia stealing the chickens. As a result, his case was dismissed. He went home angry because he knew those were his chickens. His chickens were bigger than those of Usia. He went to speak to his sick mother who, who had now recovered. He asked her to intervene since she was respected, a respected elder in the community. And should she address the matter, even Sia would bring back the chickens. His mother simply said, leave it all to God. I will stop here uh, for now. So we are meeting a character who is going through a situation of leaving his whole life, relocating to a new space to take care of his sick mother. Probably they didn't have that tight of a relationship because she didn't raise him but he had that responsibility because it's his mother. Now he comes, she comes in. Hello to everybody joining us. He comes in and uh, she, uh, after taking care of his mother, he sees a, a, an opportunity to build a business. But as he's building this business, things go south. Firstly, I wanna speak about the psychology of moving from one place to another and not because of a choice, but because of a need. What does one have to take into consideration as the person who is receiving, the person who's been traveling, who's left their life to move to the space? Um, so, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting one because the reality is he left to go take care of the mother and the mother who could not you know, take care of herself. And I think, you know, looking at um, the black context is that parents really want to be taken care of by their children, whether they are sick or they are not sick. And I think the, as the person who's receiving the love of the person who's just traveled is that they may feel quite guilty. Uh, um, you know, they're feeling guilty because the person had to leave their life and pluck themselves away. But also at the same time, I think there needs to be a sense of gratitude to say, we understand the life that you've left behind. And I think what usually the trap of, I want to generalize here a little bit, but the trap yeah. of parents is that they recognize <coughs> the, the move, but they never really kind of like say a thank you to say, I acknowledge the sacrifices that you've made. In, you know, mm. Is the hardest thing for anyone, including whether you've moved away or you now have to take care of your family or it's black kids or whatever we call it. It's the, oh, thank you for sending us the money or thank you for coming, but it's never really a, I see the sacrifice that you've made. I see the cost. Mm. So you could have bought yourself something. You could have done something. Exactly. You could have grown, you know, your business out there, but you chose to bring it here. And yeah. Because for that acknowledgement to happen, and I think the resentment that, that comes with having to take care of parents stems from that because it's like but am I not really appreciated for the things that I've done because I think also the other narrative becomes but we as older people have endured way more so that you can go to school and study and actually get this money because you wouldn't have this money in any case had you not made this 
Exactly. The fact that there's a sacrifice that you know um Manga has made as well, you know. Mm. He says whatever sacrifices parents have made doesn't nullify the fact that children are still making sacrifices, and it's a different world um right now than they live, and they need to be able to acknowledge that that people will want to work for passion. People will want you know to not just go to a job for the sake of having a job. Mm. Um, that means something, and having to lead a life where you are enjoying is a lot. Mm. And I think I like how you bring it. I mean, you brought another aspect to it because I think that's what many uh, relationship, especially within the black community, what has made the parents children relationship not be steady is that the parents see they can see the sacrifice, they can see the action. Not they can see it, but they don't acknowledge it. So they see the action, they see what you are doing for them, but they don't acknowledge the depth of what it took or what it cost you. to provide what you are giving to them and i think a lot of children then go around being resentful you know they go around carrying this thing of i'm doing it but out of obligation and no more out of love because no one is seeing it so usmanga then packs his bags and he moves here then he decides to you know what let me start a business and his business starts to grow and is feeding the the community then we meet usia and usia is now a jealous being because he sees the business and he's got this thing over to this umafiki zoro you can't come into my hood and do better than me in my hood so i'm going to do the business because i know the people here they will support me but when he realizes that usmanga is still flourishing and then he's i want to touch on the fact that usmanga's mother doesn't acknowledge the fact that usmanga is having a business she's taking his chicken she's taking his vegetables She's like you can have this you can go enjoy with your family forgetting the fact that he's doing a business how do you reconcile that especially for Usmanga's sake because Usmanga now is feeling like this is my mom but she's doing me wrong how do i have that conversation without causing her to be more sick yeah that i think that is probably the difficulty with most people that want to talk to their parents and again yeah because i think the one thing you think about is the 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 culture of being raised sometimes includes a you don't talk that you don't question your elders or your the adult people in your family and for smanga to come back and say but my you shouldn't have done a b c and d would have to require a lot of courage but also at the same time for the mom to see that what she did was wrong is also going to have to take a lot from her um and even respect to acknowledge to say okay fine um i did do you wrong i shouldn't have done that i should recognize that you're not just a child in this house but you're actually an entrepreneur and i think that's the the difficult thing as well is that having parents struggle you know as we're talking about that conflict it's the struggle to see your child in more than one way it's having to see that this person is not just a child that i grew up you know that i raised you know took out of nappies and all of that but this person has now developed into an adult that can mm-hmm. um and for the family and can make the sacrifices that they've done for the goodness of my house but also at the same time this person is an entrepreneur trying to build something you know if you can't necessarily just give things without having to give consent because i have to recognize the different roles that you play in the family more than just for my son and i think that kind of relationship or the, the tension of having to recognize different parts of your children is the difficulty when it comes to parents and um and acknowledging that so i think for smang it would have to address because the thing is we have to teach parents we have to teach black parents how to relate to us as as adults just like you know the narrative is we have to teach boys how to relate to women and how to speak to them. we have to teach our parents how to relate to us how to actually understand us in the times that we in and the responsibilities that we also have because i think the other thing is that parents then don't recognize the amount of anxiety that you know the generation is filled with because of the many things that they have to think about and it's also a narrative of the you guys are so we can you know you're not like us we need to be very strong but the other thing is we have to acknowledge that it's not that they were so strong it's that they were also emotionally unavailable like they were they had to build, they had to build walls around 
upon themselves so that they can survive. We don't have to survive. Therefore, we're going to allow our emotions to speak to us, for them to speak to us with an emotional vocabulary and express those things. Because we don't have to hide anymore. You know, they did the groundwork for us so that we can mm. and we're not hiding behind walls and, you know, unavailability. Wow, that was a lot. That was a lot. That actually makes me want to move to this piece. Um, Zulu girl. So a child is writing to her mother after she has been had the privilege of sitting in and watching her mother go through certain things. Her mother is married in an intercultural relationship. So her mother is from one tribe and the father is from another tribe. And so the mother... As we know, the woman has to be welcomed in the father's part. Well, that's how we do, we, we do it in black families. And she then takes over that culture. So this is uh, the story of the Zulu girl. Zulu girl is what they called you. They silenced your voice and stole your dreams. They hugged you when they needed you, stabbed you in the back when, they, when you had nothing to offer anymore. They left you naked while inviting the whole world to see your dirty laundry. Far away from your parents' comfort, in a foreign land that seeks to erase your name from its history books, you remained standing, unshaken but broken, stuck in the mud and choking with shame, yet you kept your smile. You smiled. Smiled not because you were happy, but just to keep the fruit of your womb alive, you smiled. I cried. When you thought no one was looking, I was on the other side, watching. When you thought you were alone, I was there praying. While your, while your soldiers fell in battle, I remained standing with your tears stored up in a cup just so to pour life into your forgotten identity. Zulu girl, I found hope in your eyes. Though, I found hope in your eyes even though your heart never stopped bleeding. To this day, you stand tall amongst giants a yellow bone of note with your once black afro now turned gray resting gracefully upon your head. On your shoulders, I stand bold, reaching for my dreams. I know they made you feel worthless, but you forgave them. My prayer today is that someday you may find it in your heart to forgive yourself. When you're speaking about emotional unavailability, of our parents and the generation that raised us. This girl is writing this piece, observing her mother's pain and the conflict. And she says, when you thought you were alone, I was there watching. When you thought no one could see it, I was there. I could see it, you know? And when your soldiers, those that were standing for you, f fell in battle, lost the war, I was still there standing, meaning I was ready, holding this cup, with your tears, just to pour life into you again. Um, but now we are dealing with a, a, a young woman who is now mothering the person who's supposed to mother her. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, that's the reality of most people, um, especially in, you know, in black communities, is that we have to parent our parents. It's, mm. And and not and and that's difficult, you know, because as a child, all you want is just to be taken care of. You want to, you know, you want your parents to make sense of your experiences, for them to to say, oh, this is right, this is wrong. But when you have to observe it, because I mean, she's saying, I am looking and I'm seeing. So she has to observe how to take care of herself from how the mom is taking care of herself. And I think that's the that's part of the you know patterns of how we relate to people is that if we saw our parents not taking care of themselves or not loving themselves or not leaving toxic relationships, we'll also build a tolerance in ourselves to stay and you know stay in toxic relationships and not leave because we think that's what portrays a strong woman and that's what you need to do for you to be you know to feel like you're successful and you're not giving mm. up relationships. And I think that that's very toxic. You know, mm. As you were reading, I'm just thinking of the burden this young girl is feeling with having to observe all of this because as much as you you know it's it's there in front of her, it's also very painful because now she has you know made herself a container 
she has made herself the person that contains the tears and, and is ready to fight for her own mother. And that's a lot of pain. That's a lot of strain. And that's why you find people just feeling this levels or high levels of expectations from other people. And now they start mothering everyone. They will mother their partners. You know, they are friends. friends. Everywhere they are. They're just colleagues. They are busy mothering. They're just busy mothering <laughs> because that's what they have learned as part of who wow. they are. So part of their identity is this person that keeps nurturing. And it's the same mm-hmm. thing with, you know, with guys as well. It's just, if you grew up, you know, with a mom like that, all you know is just nurturing and nurturing and nurturing and you keep nurturing everyone. And people take advantage of that because they can see. But I think also what, what usually happens is that they nurture so much because that's what they want for themselves. That's what yeah, they want. that's the need. It's a cry out. They're crying out for help. For help, it's all I'm doing so much for you because I really would like you to be a fraction of what I do for you. Mm. Wow, that's deep. And so, how do we then, how does this character, how does she break this cycle? How does he break this cycle? How do we as a community break the cycle of saying, I'm not, because when she ends this poem, she says, You have forgiven them, and I've seen that. But my prayer is that you forgive yourself because somehow she still noticed that the mother is still grieving the fact that she never stood, she never fought. So in a sense, she's like, I'm still going to mother you until you get yourself to a point where you've forgiven yourself. And so how do we break that cycle? How do we as a community walk away and become better for ourselves so that we're not toxic in the relationships that we engage in? the balance with that is knowing that as I think generally black people or community people are caregivers, you know, I think there's a a big sense of unity, there's a big sense of you don't leave people crying behind, you can't, you don't walk away from situations like that and I think the balance then is about having to balance that and having to put yourself in the firing line because of someone that's crying or because of someone that's not there. So we have to learn how to balance so that we can preserve. So self-preservation is a very important thing, and that's what we don't do. We yeah. And so much for the sake of other people, and we don't self-preserve, and that's that's what we need to start learning. We need to learn to start preserve, self-preserving. So what is it that I feel like I've done enough of? You know, you can take care of someone, you can do that for them, but when there's a time when you say, "Okay, I've done enough," and I'm going to continue doing A, B, C. But I am not going to put myself on the line. I'm not going to not live my life just because I'm, I'm taking care of you and I have to be A, B, C, D. Because then that's what takes away. And that's what builds resentment. And that even when you get to relationships, it's like you're coming with a lot of baggage because you already took care of you know, your family, your parents so much that you have no capacity to take care of the partner. You know, you'll find people having narratives like, Hey, I'm not here to A, B, C, D with you. Or I'm not here to take care of you. I'm not here to nurse your feelings. But literally, that's what you are in a relationship to do. You're there to care for each other's emotions. And when you go into a relationship already so burdened emotionally, you're not going to be able to do that transaction. Mm. Either for them, like they're there for you. Or you're going to overcompensate because you're aware that you don't bring enough. And when you start overcompensating, then you bring way more and you're going to get burnt out and people are going to use you. And they're going to um, take advantage of that. So I think the imp- important thing is always to acknowledge. Always to acknowledge where you're falling short. And from acknowledging, having to see where can I balance. Because as much as she, she's observing and she's saying, you know what, I'm going to be there for you. There's a, there's a, the time where she has to realize that her mom doesn't want it. It's mm. To ask for help because mm. that, when a person is ready to heal, they stop asking for help. You know, exactly. Patients of listen, I regret not having lived. I regret having stayed in this situation because that's what eats people up. It's the guilt. It's the guilt of yeah. Why did, Why did I not walk away? Why did I I do this? Why did I allow this person? Who am I? Because mm. I, Recognize who I am right now, having tolerated so much that I didn't think I tolerate. But mm. build up that tolerance is a gradual process. You don't wake up one day 
and you're living with a person who, you know, beats you up, who doesn't respect you, and who does all of these things, it builds up. It starts emotionally. Mm. It feels like things are being pasted on, but it's really just a build up and build up of emotions that at some point it's just like, how did I end up so deep um, in this mad? Mm. And I think that, I mean, in closing, because we've got like two, three minutes or so left, I want to touch on, I mean, this conversation was a lot. We definitely would need a part two of it. Um, but how important, because you say that sometimes we have this, as a community, we've got this hero syndrome of not wanting people to find their own way out, where we feel the burden of having to save the next person at an expense sometimes of our own self and of our own life. And we've seen this with all these characters that we dealt with. So just in closing, what would you say to us as a community? And I say us, I'm speaking to the black community, to the black South African, to the African around the world. What would you say about the importance of mental health and taking care of self before we become heroes to everybody else? I think that the reason, I mean, to just think, well, as you were talking about the hero syndrome, what I was thinking about is we do that because we need a sense of identity. Um, we, need, we need to find value in ourselves. And part of where we find value in ourselves is when we start doing things. We don't mm. think presence is enough. We don't think mm. like sexually, emotionally in pain, that's enough to give you a sense of, at least I'm not alone. You want to do stuff. You want to cook. You want to bring food. You want to do all of these things. And, and that's how we express. And I think as a community, what we need to understand is that we're not always going to be able to do. We can just be with people. We can just be present. Um, we can say, I am here for you. And I think mm. what we're doing as well is that we replace. Because we're so uncomfortable with talking about emotions, we replace that with action. So if I come to your house when a person has passed away and I just come and I do a lot of things and I clean and I serve, I don't have to say, I'm really sorry for your loss. I don't have to say, how are you feeling? Because you know that I'm there for you. But yeah. I'm, but, but I'm not saying it. But I think sometimes if you just said the words, you know, if you yeah. said the words and said, I am here for you, I, how are you doing? How are you feeling? it would minus a lot of the things that we have to do to prove to prove mm. that we actually care and that we are here for you and that we are in this together. Because sometimes that's all the actions are. It's just to say we are here. <laughs> yeah. communicate that. And, and most of the time, people actually want the words. They can see mm. the actions that they wonder, Yo, are you here just because you're feeling burdened? Are you here mm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. I think we're going to definitely have another conversation. Uh, we need to have these conversations a lot more. We need to heal our people. We need to find ourselves in scenarios and just play out because I think we were using fictional characters, but these are situations that we could be happening in everybody else's life. Mo Africa mo Start with you. Heal yourself. Stop being a hero. Sometimes stop doing. If we stopped to try to prove that we care, we would really be able to say what needs to be said, and therefore our actions would be genuine, and people would receive our love and the fact that we care. This has been an exciting journey, everybody. It's been three weeks of amazing conversations, and uh, we're shutting off or we're closing today the He Art Live conversation. But, but. From next week, Wednesday, every single Wednesday at 9 p.m., I will be having the He Art Extra, where we're going to be celebrating people that are doing great things in their own careers and in their own lives and uh, learning more. My name is Siposetu. Thank you to Luanele for coming through. Uh, we only have like 19 seconds left, but uh, <laughs> we're going to continue this conversation beyond the space. To everybody else, my book is available on Amazon for the electronic version and the hard copies, you can inbox me and we will talk about how we get it.